should you discount your commission or should you not? And mm -hmm. if you do, is there ever a case for it? And so we're going to get into all of that. Um, I think to start the conversation off, Ben, is the way in which at least I look at uh, uh, commissions. Well, I look at it a bunch of different ways. But the first thing that for me that comes to mind is it's really a negotiation between two people around an exchange of value, right? Yeah. We, yeah. So we talk a lot about prices, simply what you pay. Value is what you get. And so we're going to unpack that cute little saying in today's episode. Um, how do you think about this without getting into maybe any of the tactical things we might unpack, but just 30,000 foot view, how do you approach or what is the first thing you think about when it comes to discounting commission? It is the best real life way to prove to your client your value proposition. Mm, tell us about that. It's a great way to put it. So as you sit down with somebody, oftentimes they will, especially if you're unprepared for the appointment, you don't have a clear way to outline the agenda, a clear way to walk them through and kind of get ahead of some of the objections they will kind of lead the meeting straight to the three things they know to ask about. And one of those biggest ones is what do you charge? Yeah. And um, oftentimes we fall for the bait and just try and get into it. Right. And I think if we just get straight to it, you can always find somebody that's cheaper and it it's, it's a race to the bottom. So the way that I've had the most success spinning it around with the seller is um, trying to position and, and just demonstrate real life the value that I provide through my negotiation skills. And the simplest way I think to put it is, Mr. Seller, if, if I'm not willing to take you through and show you why I, you know, the value I can provide and this, that, and the other, and 6%, and fight for my income at the end of the day like i still have to pay my broker i have to pay the buyer broker right and it's only going to harm you if if we if we kind of take this off cuz at the end of the day like if i'm not willing to fight for my own commission when i need to negotiate on your behalf how how do you see that going right yeah. an agent willing to just go straight to 2% or 4% or whatever, there's always gonna be somebody that can do it. If I just jump straight down there for how I feed my family, when it's time to negotiate your equity, how do you see that going? Yeah, I love it. I love the word that you use when you said demonstrate because I think a lot of people love to tell people things. There's no better opportunity for a real estate agent to demonstrate or to show a prospective seller their skills than the negotiation around compensation. Mm. And using that to be the value proposition and winning the business uh, through that negotiation, whatever that ends up being. And I think you you nailed it. The demonstration around your ability to negotiate your income is a direct reflection on how you might negotiate their equity. And mm -hmm. I think I think it's it's fair to argue that and you can communicate this to the seller and we'll we'll get into it in a, in a way that they they start to see this for themselves in that if you are if you have a willingness to not fight or not negotiate on your own behalf. Yeah. Well, then isn't it reasonable that if you're not even willing to negotiate on your own children's behalf, on your own like uh, self-worth, would it be safe to assume that there's little chance you do that for others? Mm. And so if I'm talking to a seller, that might be one of the things that we bring up. But and First, the reason, go ahead. sorry, well, I, I just want to make sure we're on the same page. The reason we bring that up in the first place is just to, in my opinion, is alter their belief in the first place 
of not all agents are the same. And I think that is the the biggest piece of why they want the cheapest because they think any agent is going to get the price, the home sold for the same price. Yeah. And we're going to, we're going to talk, maybe, maybe we get into that right now. Um, yeah. Why don't we get into that point right there? Cause, cause that was something I had written down as well, Ben is, is why are sellers, why are sellers bringing this up from, from which lens are they asking for an agent to do anything with their commission? So let's get into that. So to me, it's what you said in the beginning, which is it's what they think they need to be asking, but more so I really believe they're asking because all right, real quick, and then we'll get right back to the content. If you're a real estate agent, you're looking to build a listing based business, a business where you can generate a multiple six figure income, a business that doesn't require you to waste thousands of dollars on the new marketing gimmicks, then I'm going to invite you to click the link right underneath this video to learn about our listing agent Academy coaching program. This is a six month intense coaching system that more than 3,000 agents from every market all over the country have now gone through. And here's the reality. Here's the truth. I will shoot you straight. This program is not for everyone. This is for agents who value being around winners. They value being in a community of other real estate agents that actually show up, that actually put forth the work. And this is for agents that embrace high levels of accountability and visibility. To get the details, all you have to do is click the link beneath this video. You can schedule a coaching consultation and then you can decide for yourself. So with that being said, let's jump back into the content. They believe that, yes, all agents are the same. So if I end up paying less in their commission, that then means indirectly I put more money in my pocket. Mm. I mean, that's why they're asking I think that for the most part, people aren't asking um, just to ask. They're asking about commission or they're fighting for you to lower your commission because of how it impacts them and their net bottom line. Do you see that any differently or do you think that's pretty straightforward? No, I, and you've talked about it and maybe you can go into this right now is just the value equation of, yeah. of why they're kind of going to that point because all they want is to... They don't know how to maybe articulate it, but they just want to make the most money. Yeah. And they think by paying you less, it's going to help them get that. That's right. That's right. So, you know, again, I think commissions and negotiation, we're going to come to it. There's so much to cover. So I'm not, I'm trying not to rush it, right? Because I don't, I want to unpack one thing at a time so the audience can kind of track with us. So let's stick yeah. with this. Yeah. The, the, the worldview the seller has is and how would they think any differently that's our job is to communicate the difference in order to be right. better you have to be different and in order to be different you have to have an, a, a comparison i heard mm -hmm. a great great i was listening to a podcast from from cody sanchez she's freaking phenomenal by the way and she talked about in order to a lot of people think that um being different means you need to add a new equation to, to a new variable. But oftentimes, in order to be different, you just have to take what they already know to be common and change something that they know to be common. In, in other words, if, if there were six cars that were parked on your street every single day, and that was the norm, and you came home and all of a sudden there was 24 cars parked there, well, you would know a huge difference because you had something to compare to. So... For me, the first thing to unpack with a seller is that worldview of every agent's the same. Right. So, of course, if I pay less, I win. So here's exactly what we get into. If price is what you pay, value is what you get. The first thing I would, I would communicate to a seller is that, in fact, every agent's different. In fact, that if you are looking to pay the least, then I like to push it. I like to push the envelope that side hard. So so if, the best way to do that is get to get in some type of role play, right? And so I would say things like this. You know, Ben, listen, I there's two types of people that I've worked with in the 20 years I've been doing this. Some people are really focused on just paying the least amount of money. Like regardless of what they put in their pocket, 
They just want to pay the least. Now, for those people, there are companies out there that do just that. I mean, you could pay nearly next to nothing. And do they get the result that sellers want? Maybe, maybe not. Then there's a different seller who says, well, what I care about, I don't care how much I pay. I care about what I put in my pocket. You see, if it takes, I have to hire a better agent because they're going to get me a better result, then it's worth it for me to hire that person and pay a little bit more because that means I get a little bit more. Now, the question mm -hmm. you have to answer or that we have to talk about is which of those two things, Ben, are important to you? And there's no right or wrong answer. It's Ben's world. It's Ben's decision. And ultimately, Ben, it's up to you. And so I ask you, of those two, what are more important to you? You know, paying well, the Brandon, least I amount of make, money? Yeah. yeah. I just want to make the most amount of money. That's it. Yeah. Now, this is great. This is a good step one. Okay. This is exactly what we want to do. Because now what we've done is we've clearly articulated. We didn't, we're not telling the seller that they're dumb or no, nothing like that. We've used a third party story to validate these two different examples, these two types of sellers. There's a lot of labeling that just occurred that the new salesperson doesn't really understand. But in this context, maybe in that role play, it, it'll be rare that a seller says, yeah, I'm the first one. I'm can the can one. I throw in a story that, yeah, that I please. throw in there as well? Yeah. I Instead of using agents, a lot of times I'll use an example of like attorneys. And I'll mm. say, let's pretend you were on trial. Like it was like prison, like life and death, basically. Like you'd go to prison forever. Um, would you want just the cheapest attorney possible? Or would you want an attorney, no matter what it cost, that you feel would set you free. Right. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. Just to kind of like take your eyes off of agents and, and focus more on, you know, just a completely third, third party situation. Yeah. And there's, there's a, that's a great analogy. And there's questions coming in from the live audience and our mastermind and Keith, I see it. I'm going to come, I'm going to come to your question in just a second. Um, but those are great analogies where people can really resonate, Ben, to your point, which is like, has there ever been a time where you went the cheap route and you regretted it? Everyone exactly. can resonate with that. And so yeah. we're talking about your house. And, and the other thing I like to say here is I need to make it clear to the seller that I'm not vying to convince them. I'm not trying to convince them to do business with me. Mm -hmm. If I'm trying to help them understand that by paying the least may be in their, not in their best interest. Regardless if, if, if they end up doing business with me, because sometimes if you try to explain this to somebody, they say, well, of course, you're trying to, you're, you're, you're arguing for yourself. So then yeah. what I'll say is, hey, listen, Ben, regardless if, if you and I ever end up doing business together, like putting that aside for a second, this is the best question I love to ask in this conversation. I will say, can I share with you my biggest fear? Now, the curiosity loop for the seller is just like off the chain now, right? I mean, they're just like, they, they can't wait to hear what you have to say when you ask them, hey, can you discount your commission? And I say, love it. I get that question all the time. Can I share with you my biggest fear? Now Please. they're leaning in. And now you can really get into the fact that of all the things we're talking about, if an agent, and, and let me just preface this because I think a lot of the audience may, and I missed this in the beginning, there is a time and place for you to list a house under a commission structure that isn't rigid. So I'm going to preface that. So I'm not, yes. right? So I'm not so rigid to turn away business because of an ego. We should it's have prefaced the whole show. Though. When are yeah. we going to talk about that? When are we going to do it? How are we going to do it? When does it make sense to do it? So that you, well, you, there's a right way and a wrong way to do it. And we're going to get into that. So I preface that with that, right? There's a time and place when it makes sense. And so we'll come back to that. But now when you, when you open it up and say, can I share my biggest fear with you? Mm -hmm. You know, an, an agent who demonstrates to you, proves to you their lack of negotiating skills, how might that impact you and your net bottom line equity? 
How might that is probably one of the greatest ways to structure a question under the Socratic method to get the person to start to think. That might be one way to do it. And then you can get into a story. There's a lot of sellers who at the beginning think that, listen, all these agents are the same. So all I have to do is find the agent who charges the least and I end up netting more money. What they don't know is all of the things that go into selling a home, what it takes to negotiate, what it takes to position a property, what it takes to market a property, how do they handle these conversations? And so all I know is I have to go off of my experience with the agent. And if you're experiencing with the agent right now, their lack of ability to negotiate on their own behalf, how do you think they might handle the negotiation of your equity, Ben, when you're not looking? Not well. Not well. So, so <laughs> They're just focused on getting it across the finish line. Yeah. Now, when I can get the seller to verbalize that, then it makes sense to get into the third-party story of like, hey, there's two types of people. There are people who are looking to pay the least, and there are people who are looking to get the most value. Mm. And I love to put it that way. Pay the least or get the most value. And there's nothing wrong with either one, by the way. There's not a right one or a wrong one. However, if you're looking to pay the least and not get the most for your house, I'm not your guy. Mm. I'm not the agent for you. It's probably one of the greatest things you can do in that negotiation. I'm just not the agent for you. In fact, I'd be happy to refer you to a lot of agents that that charge the least. If you're not, if you're just not interested in working with a professional to pr protect your equity, I know a lot of agents who will come in here and do it for pretty much free. Now, you can't mm -hmm. get mad at me when they don't sell your house or it doesn't go well, right? And then we could joke about it. Now, to Keith's point, do you want to add anything, Ben, before we get into Keith's question? Because it's a really good one. Yeah, I just think that ultimately what we're trying to do is increase their certainty of That's us right. being able to do it and decrease the risk. And yep. the whole time, the reason we're doing these third-party stories, everything is just to build that gap bigger and bigger because we use the examples of a you know flat fee or somebody like that. Just sure, you're, you might initially perceive your risk being lower by paying less. And what we're doing is focusing on the end result, the certainty of getting the product done not what they might assume is That's right. the risk, is the cost. Yeah. So you that was exactly right. So that is Keith's question. How how do we show how, how do we present the gap? So mm -hmm. the value equation that we talk about in, in our business of real estate sales is exactly what Ben's talking about is we have to do two things simultaneously in order to show value. So anybody that's listening to the show who hasn't watched or heard this before you'll want to take some notes. The value equation states that we have to increase the seller's certainty that we can, in fact, produce a, a result that is in their best interest and at the same time decrease their risk, building that gap in between. Now, here's the key thing that I think a lot of agents miss, Ben. That is a feeling. It's a perception because at the table, you don't know what you don't know. That is to that plays to our advantage. Yes. Because there has not been a result produced yet. So how do we do that? Well, and for the people that didn't see Keith's question, that's what he's asking. How like everybody sounds the same. That's and right. Back to your point. How now we demonstrate it. Yeah, yeah. So so how do you show it, right? How do you prove it? How do you how do you increase certainty? How do you decrease risk so that that gap in between is is as wide as possible? And what we know, the wider that is, the gap in between there is called value. So if you mm -hmm. haven't done it, there's very little value. Further apart, more value. So so how do you do that? Well, we do things that no one else is doing, right? Remember, in order to be better, you must be different. Well, Brandon, can you give us some examples? Sure. I'm going to start, Ben, by talking about the performance-based compensation. Mm -hmm. Now, coaching clients, they, they probably haven't even heard it this way either, quite frankly. Because what they think I'm talking about is how the buyer gets procured depends on how the compensation gets structured. I'm not even talking about that. I'm talking about the seller who is adamant 
you know, in, in working with an agent who's going to discount their fee. Well, here's what I'll tell you. This is sellers eat this up. So first off, start calling commission compensation. That'd be my first recommendation. Number two, structure it in a way that is performance based. Sellers will eat this up. And the way you do that is this. You say, because it's a negotiation, Ben, here's something that I've done with some clients in the past that, that could make sense. Can I share that with you as it relates to compensation and how it all works and really something I think could work for both of us? Because this is how you structure it to make the seller feel like there's a win-win or there's a compromise, okay? Mm -hmm. So you say, I think that you and I are both on the same page and based on what you've told me, at the end of the day, you're less concerned with how much commission someone charges and you're more concerned with how much goes into your pocket or your bank account for you and your family. Is that fair? That's right. That's right. Did I miss anything there? Or you feel like we're totally aligned? Nope. Yeah. Okay. Now, if, if, if that's the case, then I'm wondering if it could make sense for us to structure the compensation in a way that you are protected from your downside and I have an incentive to perform on your behalf. And the way mm -hmm. I've done this in the past with sellers is say, okay, there's going to be a price to the home that you and I agree on. And if I could produce that result and that results in you getting what you want in your pocket net bottom line, I earn X. If I produce a result that puts you in a position to get more than you signed up for, would it be fair to say that I would get compensated more? Is that an idea that you might be open to? Sure. Well, how about this? How about if I don't perform? If we agree to a number and I don't perform and I produce results that weren't what you were expecting, that my compensation is directly relying, uh, aligned to the result that I get you. In other words, your bottom line and my bottom line are in direct alignment. Is that something that you think could benefit both of us? That sounds extremely fair. Yeah, right? Because the agent who's just going to discount next to nothing, is it fair to say you don't know what that person will do to protect your net bottom line because they're not even making anything off the deal? So a seller could argue, well, you're not even... Or do you even care about this? You're only going to make a couple hundred bucks, right? Right. So if we had a, a structure to our compensation where... I only got paid based on how I performed for you. That's an idea that you be open to. Absolutely. And this is where we could start to get into out of the role play, structuring it in a way where like, okay, we're going to list the house at 500K. If I could produce you, or if I can get us a offer that's at, you know, between this range and this range, here's what the compensation would be. If I can get you an offer that's more than what you signed up for, so your price or more, I love saying that. If I can get you your price or more, mm. right? And then here's what that could look like. And if if we go on the market and I'm only able to produce result like this, then that's a world where I shouldn't earn my full compensation. I should get a demotion, right? I shouldn't get paid the way in which I should if I perform well for you. You agree with that, right? That's one way to do it. So this is, starts to go down the path, Ben, of that increasing certainty. Because now the seller's yep. like, well, you're directly aligned. You're yep. financially in, in incentivized to produce. Unlike all the other agents, whether they get me a great offer or not great offer, they still get their 4%, 5%, 6%. Now we've aligned our interest that nobody can debate. Make sense? Absolutely. 100%. That's number one. Now, we keep going even further because when we're done with this, the seller's like, this is a no-brainer. Then we start getting into the, we say, okay, now the next thing we have to look at is when it comes to performance. I think that the idea that when a seller hires an agent like me, I believe that they believe that that agent is going to be the one selling the home. Would that be your expectation? Yeah, I guess so. Now, what if I told you that that rarely happens, if ever? In other words, what happens in real in the real world, Ben, is an agent will list someone's home like yours. They'll go and put it on the open market. And in our market right now, about 90, 95% of the time, another agent is selling the house. 
would that surprise you or what are your how, how do you see that and they would say guess, blah 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 i guess i don't know tell me yeah what do you mean? well well here's the thing i believe that you're hiring me to sell the home and so there's three ways a buyer can come to fruition on your property Sure. One is the one we're talking about right now is you hire me and I go out there and I find the buyer for your property. Just the way I would assume you assume it's going to happen anyways. And if that happens, we have a compensation structure that we talked about that is fair for both you and I, right? Right. Well, yeah. The other way that it can happen is what if another agent brings us a buyer for your property? Well, certainly we'd be open to that if they gave us an offer and it financially is your price or more, we're not going to turn that down, right? No. Like you don't care who buys the house, just that they give you a great offer for the property. And then the third way is a world where, Ben, you've hired me to produce this result for you. Well, what happens if you produce the result that you hired me for? Should I still get paid my full compensation? Probably not. Would you agree? Absolutely. Yeah, there's a chance, Ben, that you might come across somebody who finds out you're selling your home, a neighbor, a neighbor's cousin, and they say, Ben, my cousin wants to buy your house. Well, who did the job? You actually (laughs) brought the buyer, right? So under those circumstances, a compensation structure would be different, okay? And so you would be more incentivized and I would be penalized. I think Mm -hmm. that if our, my compensation is just aligned in these two ways, based on my performance and based on how the buyer gets procured, determines ultimately the, the the compensation for for our relationship. So that'd be the second thing. Then I get into what I believe may be the most important piece because your competition just isn't willing to do this. Why? Because this will this will say everything. When you when you talk to a client to say, here's the best part. We could sit here and go back and forth, but it's all talk, right? Like you don't know what you don't know. You don't know if after you hire somebody, what they're going to do when they walk out of your house. Can we agree on that? Absolutely. Yeah. You, you, you just don't know. And so because in my experience, understanding that the biggest complaint that the consumers have with our industry is this, is that an agent they hire says they're, you know, they're going to do this, they're going to do that. And then they leave and they do very little. But the problem with that is this. Can I share that with you? Please. Again, opening up the curiosity loop. Most agents that you will ever talk to, that anybody will ever talk to, is going to ask you to sign what we call an exclusive right to sell contract under a certain amount of time. And that contract locks you into that agent, to that brokerage for the duration of the time. Now, even Mm -hmm. if you end up firing that agent because they're doing a bad job, the company, Ben, can still hold that listing hostage. In other words, you wouldn't be able to list it with anybody else until after the time frame. Now, to me, that poses a major risk to the seller because what if the seller ends up hiring an agent based on false expectations, false promises, and does very little? Now you're handcuffed to, to a situation that you don't want to be in. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Absolutely. So what we do is create a world of accountability that doesn't exist in our industry. And the way Mm -hmm. I do that is this, is our agreement is based on one of performance, as I've clearly demonstrated today. And it's based on results. It's based on walking the walk, not talking the talk. And so if there's a world where you and I agree to do business together and we do, in fact, move forward, well... If you feel as though I'm not holding up my end of the bargain, what do you believe you will be able to do? Uh, maybe get out. Yeah, not you can fire me. Hostage. You can fire me. Now, if I'm you and I'm sitting in your shoes, I might be asking myself, wait a minute, you're t- telling me if I hire you tonight and you don't show up and you don't do all the things you say you're going to do, I, I can just fire you like I have no downside risk at all. Why would you do that, Brandon? You might be asking that because a lot of my competitors do. You guys see I'm giving the sellers, I'm changing their worldview for them, but it's exactly what they're thinking. Mm. Well, it's because, Ben, well, let me ask you rather, 
why do you believe I would offer some crazy guarantee like that that my competitors aren't willing to do, in your opinion? To, to lower my risk. And why else? Why else would you think I might offer something like this that my competitors aren't willing to do? To earn your business. Yeah, because I'm going to do what it is I say I'm going to do. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> otherwise, you get to fire me. I don't know about you, but I don't like working for free. That's the only reason is because mm -hmm. I, ha I have to put myself in a position to perform. Because mm -hmm. otherwise, you can just fire me and I end up making no money, right? Absolutely. Now, at the same point, and this is where we want equal business stature. At the same point, if we end up working together, and I make a little joke about this, if I find that you're the crazy seller, and sometimes they happen, I get the same right. I get to fire you too if <laughs> you become the unreasonable seller, right? And we have a little joke about that. I say, is that fair? Does that all make sense in all seriousness, Ben? Does all that seem Absolutely. fair for you? And yep. so now we've, we've talked about so much. We talked about uh, negotiating our commission, demonstrating our commission. We talked about how to increase certainty by decreasing risk, by offering guarantees that people aren't willing to offer. And the goal is that the seller starts to say, wow, this is, this is real value, right? Because so many agents are just willing to drop their pants. Yep. If I need to win the business by discounting my commission, I will do it. And we've already implanted these seeds of doubt in the seller's mind. Ben, if you mm -hmm. ever end up meeting with an agent and they're just willing to discount their commission, we talked about the red flags. We talked about how that might be bad for you, right? And you mm -hmm. talk about all those different red flags. You talk about how commissions work, right? That's another piece to the red flag play that if you're talking with an agent who's willing to tell you they can sell your house, at a price that doesn't make sense, at a fee that is next to nothing, there's got to be something wrong, right? That makes mm -hmm. sense. We talked about all of that. So I think, let, let's just pause. I know there's yeah. probably a lot of questions in the chat, but what do you want to add to any of that so far, Ben? No, I, I want to ask your opinion on something, actually. What would you, you know, I, I know what I like to do, but in your opinion, strategy-wise, laying out all these red flags, would you agree that it, it might be best to get in and meet with somebody first? Then, you know, if they say they still want to interview other agents, it gives you the confidence to say, go ahead. What's your opinion on that versus yes. being last? Yeah, it's a great point, right? There's pros and cons to being first and last. But to your point, I don't mind going first. I think a right. lot of agents get nervous when they say, well, I'm going to meet with some other agents, blah, blah, blah. All this sounds great in my head. I love that because remember, in order Same. to be better, you've got to be different. How do you? How does that happen? By comparison. So I feel bad for anybody who has to interview after me because yeah. all these red flags come up, and it just makes me the obvious choice, even yeah, more so. These traps, and they walk right into them. You got it. That's a great way to put it. It's a great way to put it. And so you know, I'm just looking at my notes. You know, some red flags for the audience, because there's a lot of brand new real estate agents that listen and watch the show. So I just want them to get really clear on some of the red flag seeds of doubt that you can plant in a seller's mind. Okay, Num number one is to break down how do commissions actually work, right? Mm -hmm. And so you could talk about, you know, broker splits a little bit, you could talk about taxes, you could talk about net income, you could talk about investing in the listing, you, you have to break all of those certain things down, right? And the red flag that I like to break down is you could talk about the fact of the matter of the broker is going to get paid, right? So even if the agent discounts their fee, their broker is going to get paid. You and the seller can agree on that. That's an easy win. The next thing you can walk the seller through uh, through is they're probably going to want to eat, right? They're probably going to want to feed their kid. They're probably going to get paid themselves, right? Can we agree on that? Yes. Well, if commissions are responsible for broker split, the agent earning income and marketing your property and exposing your property so that you get paid the most and they discount their fee, of those three variables, which one do you think is at risk if they charge you less money? Marketing every time. 
every time. So now the, now the seller's verbalizing to themselves that by paying lease, I'm actually, me, the seller, is hurting. That's right. Right? We're, it hurts me to pay less, right? Because you mm. say you want to net more. How do we net more? We get maximum exposure, not little exposure. So that'd be one red flag. The other red flag would be the fact of negotiating skills. Ben, can I ask you a question getting back into role play? A lot of people I work with, I work with, third party story, tell me that, you know, they find it extremely important to hire a real estate agent who has strong negotiation skills. Would it be safe to assume that you may want an agent that has those skills? Would that be fair? Absolutely. There's never going to be a time, y'all, when the seller says, no, we want a weak agent who can't negotiate. Never going to happen. Okay. The second red flag is an agent who demonstrates to you and you have concrete evidence that they cannot negotiate because they proved it to you by just discounting their own income. Is it safe to assume that when they're negotiating on your behalf, behind closed doors when no one's listening, how likely is it? How likely are you to believe that they're going to negotiate when they've proved to you in person that they can't do it? That'd be the second red flag. And then the third red flag is around price. So if an agent you meet with is coming in here and is suggesting a price that is higher than everyone else's, who's promising you the moon, run for the hills. This is why properties expire off the market. Because we have agents that are desperate, that are needy to get their sign in the front yard with very, very little concern whether or not your home sells, just that they can get another listing. And so they will tell you anything, anything that they believe you want to hear if it means you will list the house. They mm -hmm. will watch this. And this is the best. Then they're like, they're, they're so scared shitless when I say this. They will tell you whatever price they think you want to hear, they'll discount their fee to zero if, if necessary. And they will create a world that is so unrealistic in hopes that they've said enough to convince you to list the property. That's probably the worst case scenario for you. Mm. And I'm not even suggesting I'm the agent for you. I'm suggesting there's a difference between a list to list philosophy and a list to sale philosophy. So those would be, oh, uh, yeah. So those would be some red flags. Love it. Those are phenomenal versus just going in there and trying to, hey, I, I'm locked in on 6%. That's what I got to have and not demonstrating anything. Like now you've changed their whole belief philosophy around all of these points, laid those little traps for the next agent if there is one. Um, yeah. and earned earned your ability to to take that listing. Yeah. And here's the other thing. So let's talk about when it might make sense to to discount, right? Because it's 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 a business decision. It it, it shouldn't be an ego decision, okay? So this will be okay. the other part that we promised the audience. I think that there's a time and place for when it makes sense. I do. Because oftentimes I've said that commissions just equal a dollar amount. Like, I don't know about you, but when I, you know, if you go to pay, you can't, you don't, you don't pay a commission percentage, you pay with dollars and cents, right? And so right. if, if some, if an agent says, okay, here's $8,000 mm -hmm. to sell a house, most of them would sign up for that. But as soon as they find out it's an $800,000 home, ego kicks in. Mm. Isn't that interesting? It is. Some it people is. caught it and some people won't, but simple math, 8,000 is 1% 1 yeah. of 800,000. But, yeah, but, but at the same point, on a $200,000 house, what's the math on that? It's it's like eight, it's like seven, what, what is it? What is the actual math on that? If it's a $2,000 house or $200,000 house, yeah. I just want to see, divided by 200,000, it's 4%. Oh, it's I 4%. see. 4%. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Meaning, meaning that would be like a 7% listing. We're talking about buyer compensation. We're not changing buyer comp, right? So that's the assumption. Yeah. The assumption is yeah. whatever your buyer compensation is in your, in your MLS, in your market, you keep that the same. You don't really want to mess with that. If it's two and a half, three, two and three quarters, 3%, right. we keep that the same. We're talking about negotiating your comp, 
right? right. And so right. it's so not you're used the- to taking a four hundred thousand dollar list and two hundred thousand right. dollar list, and you've got a guy you're sitting down with eight hundred a million, and don't die on the hill over six percent or whatever those different variables are. Look at the dollar amount and what that's going to do for you at closing. That's right. You know, if it's a if it's a seller. If it's a very sale, saleable, I call it a saleable listing, meaning that the seller's motivated, it's a property with in great condition, in a market you know is going to fly off the shelves, it's going to get multiple offers, you can leverage that listing, you can get more listings, helps you with marketing, helps you with branding, helps you with positioning, you look like an absolute hero. That's exactly right. Don't 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 be an egomaniac and just because it doesn't say 6% walk away from a $11,000 commission that could do great things for your family because of a percentage. Mm. And we're also not saying, okay, now go in there. <laughs> right. And in the first three seconds on a million dollar listing, tell them you'll do it for, for zero, right? Like that's, that's only right. after you run all the plays we, we just It's a negotiation. About. Exactly. It's a negotiation. Because here's the other argument that I would make, and I think it's a great place to end, is that what agents don't talk about, what nobody talks about in our industry for, for whatever reason is what happens is resentment. When you do things for people under a discount that all the other people that you're serving don't have, you will end up most likely resenting that person, resenting that client. Because mm-hmm. as soon as you get past the commission conversation with the seller, and let's just say you do get the listing and it's at a discounted commission. It's not like the seller saying to themselves, okay, I know, Ben, you discounted this, so you don't have to do as much for us. You don't have to right. do as much, Mark. They don't say that. They want a full blown, full service, just like it was normal. So that doesn't change. It's like, I don't care. They don't even think about it. So you, yeah. there's that built in resentment. And then what ends up often happening because there's that resentment, you don't do as much. You do cut corners and the seller ends up paying for it. And then you probably end up in a world where seller doesn't like you at the end of the transaction. You don't like the seller at the end of the transaction. And so because of that short-term gain, that short-term instant gratification, you weren't able to have a raving fan. You don't get more referrals. You didn't turn one client into three extra clients. They don't go into your database. They don't come to future events. They're not telling people about you. In fact, they are. It's just in a negative light. And so was it worth it? That'd be my last Mm. question is, was it worth it for you to win a listing with maybe a seller that was unrealistic or a pain in the ass to deal with at, at a fee that was discounted for the anxiety, for the stress, for the all of the downside to doing it too, there just has to be a give and take. It has to make sense. Mm, I love that. I love that. I, I love to say to sellers, you know, I, I'm going to, I run a business here and I'm going to do what makes sense in the end. Let's not play the what if game right now. Let, let's agree that, you know, if you're comfortable with this now and I produce, this is where we land. But at on the back end, if this is what we've got to be at and there needs to be an adjustment on both sides to get you to that number, let's have that conversation That's then right. versus having it now. Great point. You know, it's like, listen, I, I'm, I'm not, there's no ego. You know what I mean? It's like, listen, Mr. Client, I, I'm in this for the long haul. What I believe is that if, if, if all goes well and I can, we can have a, a, a phenomenal world where we're sitting at the closing table and you loved working with me, there's a likelihood that maybe you turn me on to more clients in the future. And Ben, that's how my business grows. And so that's my goal here. That's my goal is is to create a world where I can call you a client. And to me, a client means that we have a relationship long term. I love communicating that to people because then they can start to see it from, from a different lens. It says, I'm not concerned with just this, you know, like, I, you know, a lot of agents are super transactional where they give clients just terrible service and they just hate each other. They don't even want to go to the closing because they can't even be around each other. Yeah. I'm telling you, that's how most agents do their business. And that's mm-hmm. why they have no referrals. They have no repeat clients. They have no database. They have no referrals. It's just such a, it's just a transaction. You know, it's kind of like prostitution. It's like, Hey, you do this thing and I give you this money and we never talk again, you know? Oh, love it. 
So anyway, hopefully we we covered that. I mean, I can't believe it was 45 minutes. It felt like four minutes. It's good. It's, it's super valuable takeaway that hopefully people can take right away and go apply. Yeah, I'll just, I'll end with this for people that made it all the way through a 45 minute conversation. I'll just give you my, my favorite script. I know people are like, give me the words, give me the words. But, but I'll tell you, commission has everything to do with um, identity and self-confidence more so than any script, more so than any approach. Like going out into the world and being able to charge your worth has everything to do with self-image. How you see yourself is how the world sees you. And so if you have very, very little self-confidence, really you know, low self-belief, you don't have a a great self image, you know, comfortable who you are and the value you give, it will be difficult for you in the real world of this. And you'll just, you'll get crushed around the commission thing. But here's my favorite script if there was one. So if I'm talking to a seller and I touched on this a bit, I would say, Ben, listen, there's, there's really two types of people out there and there's no right or wrong answer. And I'm good either way, but there's some sellers who are just only concerned with paying the least amount of commission regardless of how much they put in their pocket. And that's fine. And then there's a different seller who says, price is what I pay, value is what I get. I'm more, I'm less concerned with how much the agent is earning. And I'm more concerned with how much I put in my pocket. And Ben, I'm just going to shoot you straight. If you're more concerned with the agent or paying as little as possible, I'm just simply not the agent for you. But if you're looking for a professional who is going to put the most money in your pocket for your family and give you a world-class client experience, then I think it's worth us continuing this conversation. But let me just stop and ask you, what is more important to you? Be be honest. You're not going to hurt my feelings. That is my favorite script, I'll call it. Thanks, Brandon. Straight fire today. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, everybody uh, in the live audience. Appreciate all your comments. Hopefully we got to everybody's questions and uh, we'll see you guys again Wednesday for another live podcast. Ben, I appreciate all your thoughts.